Section three of the New Life, La Vita Nuova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary J. The New Life, La Vita Nuova, by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Section three. Some days after the death of this lady, I had occasion to leave the city I speak of and to go thitherwards where she abode, who had formerly been my protection albeit the end of my journey reached not altogether so far and notwithstanding that i was visibly in the company of many the journey was so irksome that i had scarcely sighing enough to ease my heart's heaviness seeing that as i went i left my beatitude behind me wherefore it came to pass that he who ruled me by virtue of my most gentle lady was made visible to my mind in the light habit of a traveller coarsely fashioned he appeared to me troubled and looked always on the ground saving only that sometimes his eyes were turned towards a river which was clear and rapid and which flowed along the path i was taking and then i thought that love called me and said to me these words i come from that lady who was so long thy surety for the matter of whose return i know that it may not be wherefore i have taken that heart which i made thee leave with her and do bear it unto another lady who as she was shall be thy surety and when he named her i knew her well and of these words I have spoken, if thou shouldst speak any again, let it be in such short that none shall perceive thereby that thy love was feigned for her, which thou must now feign for another. And when he had spoken thus, all my imagining was gone suddenly, for it seemed to me that love became a part of myself, so that, changed as it were in mine aspect, I rode on full of thought the whole of that day, and with heavy sighing. And the day being over, I wrote this sonnet a day agone as i rode sullenly upon a certain path that liked me not i met love midway while the air was hot clothed lightly as a wayfarer might be and for the cheer he showed he seemed to me as one who hath lost lordship he had got advancing towards me full of sorrowful thought bowing his forehead so that none should see then as i went he called me by my name saying i journey since the morn was dim thence where i made thy heart to be which now i needs must bear unto another dame wherewith so much passed into me of him that he was gone and i discerned not how this sonnet has three parts in the first part i tell how i met love and of his aspect in the second i tell what he said to me although not in full through the fear i had of discovering my secret in the third i say how he disappeared the second part commences here then as i went the third here wherewith so much on my return i set myself to seek out that lady whom my master had named to me while i journeyed sighing and because i would be brief i will narrate that in a short while i made her my surety in such sort the matter was spoken of by many in terms scarcely courteous through the which i had often whiles many troublesome hours and by this it happened to wit by this false and evil rumour which seemed to misfame me of vice that she who was the destroyer of all evil and the queen of all good coming where i was denied me her most sweet salutation in the which alone was my blessedness and here it is fitting for me to depart a little from this present matter that it may be rightly understood of what surpassing virtue her salutation was to me to the which end i say that when she appeared in any place it seemed to me by the hope of her excellent salutation that there was no man mine enemy any longer and such warmth of charity came upon me that most certainly in that moment i would have pardoned whosoever had done me an injury and if one should then have questioned me concerning any matter i could only have said unto him love with a countenance clothed in humbleness in what time she made ready to salute me the spirit of love destroying all other perceptions thrust forth the feeble spirits of my eyes saying do homage unto your mistress and putting itself in their place to obey so that he who would might then have beheld love beholding the lids of mine eyes shake and when this most gentle lady gave her salutation love so far from being a medium beclouding mine intolerable beatitude then bred in me such an overpowering sweetness that my body being all subjected thereto remained many times helpless and passive whereby it is made manifest that in her salutation alone was there any beatitude for me which then very often went beyond my endurance and now resuming my discourse i will go on to relate that when for the first time this beatitude was denied me i became possessed with such grief that parting myself from others i went into a lonely place to bathe the ground with most bitter tears and when by this heat of weeping i was somewhat relieved i betook myself to my chamber where i could lament unheard 
and there having prayed to the lady of all mercies and having said also o love aid thou thy servant i went suddenly asleep like a beaten sobbing child and in my sleep towards the middle of it i seemed to see in the room seated at my side a youth in very white raiment who kept his eyes fixed on me in deep thought and when he had gazed some time i thought that he sighed and called to me in these words fili me tempus est ut pratumitantur simulata nostra and thereupon i seemed to know him for the voice was the same wherewith he had spoken at other times in my sleep then looking at him i perceived that he was weeping piteously and that he seemed to be waiting for me to speak wherefore taking heart i began thus why weepest thou master of all honour and he made answer to me ego tanquum centrum circuli cui simili modo se habent circumferentiae partes tu autum non sic and thinking upon his words they seemed to me obscure so that again compelling myself unto speech i asked of him what thing is this master that thou hast spoken thus darkly to the which he made answer in the vulgar tongue demand no more than may be useful to thee whereupon i began to discourse with him concerning her salutation which she had denied me and when i had questioned him of the cause he said these words our beatrice hath heard from certain persons that the lady whom i named to thee while thou journeyedst full of sighs is sorely disquieted by thy solicitations and therefore this most gracious creature who is the enemy of all disquiet being fearful of such disquiet refused to salute thee for the which reason albeit in very sooth thy secret must needs have become known to her by familiar observation it is my will that thou compose certain things in rhyme in which thou shalt set forth how strong a mastership i have obtained over thee through her and how thou wast hers even from thy childhood also do thou call upon him that knoweth these things to bear witness to them bidding him to speak with her thereof the which i who am he will do willingly and thus she shall be made to know thy desire knowing which she shall know likewise that they were deceived who spake of thee to her and so write these things that they shall seem rather to be spoken by a third person and not directly by thee to her which is scarce fitting after the which send them not without me where she may chance to hear them but have them fitted with a pleasant music into which i will pass whensoever it needeth with this speech he was away and my sleep was broken up whereupon remembering me i knew that i had beheld this vision during the ninth hour of the day and i resolved that i would make a ditty before i left my chamber according to the words my master had spoken and this is the ditty that i made song tis my will that thou do seek out love and go with him where my dear lady is that so my cause the which thy harmonies do plead his better speech may clearly prove thou goest my song in such a courteous kind that even companionless thou mayst rely on thyself anywhere and yet and thou wouldst get thee a safe mind first unto love address thy steps whose aid mayhap twere ill to spare seeing that she to whom thou makest thy prayer is as i think ill-minded unto me and that if love do not companion thee thou'lt have perchance small cheer to tell me of with a sweet accent when thou comest to her begin thou in these words first having craved a gracious audience he who hath sent me as his messenger lady thus much records and thou but suffer him in his defence love who comes with me by thine influence can make this man do as it liketh him wherefore if this fault is or doth but seem do thou conceive for his heart cannot move say to her also lady his poor heart is so confirmed in faith that all its thoughts are but of serving thee was early thine and could not swerve apart then if she wavereth bid her ask love who knows if these things be and in the end beg of her modestly to pardon so much boldness saying too if thou declare his death to be thy due the thing shall come to pass as doth behove then pray thou of the master of all ruth before thou leave her there that he befriend my cause and plead it well in guerdon of my sweet rhymes and my truth entreat him stay with her let not the hope of thy poor servant fail and if with her thy pleading should prevail let her look on him and give peace to him gentle my song if good to thee it seem do this so worship shall be thine and love this ditty is divided into three parts in the first i tell it whither to go and i encourage it that it may go the more confidently and i tell it whose company to join if it would go with confidence and without any danger in the second i say that which it behoves the ditty to set forth in the third I give it leave to start when it pleases, recommending its course to the arms of fortune. The second part begins here, with a sweet accent. The third here, 
gentle my song. Some might contradict me, and say that they understand not whom I address in the second person, seeing that the ditty is merely the very words I am speaking. And therefore I say that this doubt I intend to solve and clear up in this little book itself, at a more difficult passage, and then let him understand who now doubts, or would now contradict as aforesaid. End of section 3